So, welcome. Good morning. So, yeah, it's cool that this has started. So, uh, welcome to KubeCon. And today we are going to talk about uh, when Kubernetes is your platform and some design patterns uh, for extensible controllers. So my name is Rafael. I work for SUSE. I've been working with, Q with Kubernetes for uh, five years and a half already. And um, yeah, I have, I have contributed a little to Kube Admin, for example. And with me is Fabrizio. Hello, everyone. I am Fabrizio Pandini. I'm staff engineer at VMware. I'm tech lead in C cluster um, lifecycle, and I also work to the, in the cluster API project. So, before starting today, let's, let's take a look at, at the problem that we are trying to solve. So, today, more and more people are developing Kubernetes uh, extension. Developing a controller is becoming a mainstream practice. Uh, to solve a problem in a cloud native way. You can use a tool like Kube Builder, Operator SDK, to create a Kubernetes controller in a few minutes. And, and the idea is that the controller can watch uh, a customer resource and basically reconcile the state of your system to the, to the, to the desired state that you define in the spec. This is great. We, we all know this, uh, this pattern. But, uh, what happened when your business problems became complex? Basically, you get to a line that every developer must cross, where you, your controller alone is not enough to solve the problem. So today's presentation is about sharing some pattern, some lesson learned about how to cross this line. Um, I, before starting, I, I will just, just to point out that what we are showing today is based on experience. It's based on experience of Raphael working on projects like Kube Warden. It's based on experience that we learned in Cluster API. And there are also some ideas on how we can improve this in the future. Yeah, so now that the problem statement is clear, um, it's fine to, to start introducing the, pro the, the answer to the, to, the, to the question or to the problem. And so when we are uh, de designing extensible controllers, there are mainly two ways to do that. And uh, one way is to extend the capabilities of a single controller, but that quickly gets out of hand because it's hard to maintain. It's, it's hard to keep track of everything. And the other, uh, it's in case you need more than, you, you can have more than one controller in order to reconcile all these uh, resources, uh, but then you need to, you need to keep track of, of everything and they need, they, you need to orchestrate them somehow. So in the, in the next slides, uh, what we are going to do is to check this last part for now. So before starting, let's clarify uh, some terms because there are some loaded terms in, in, this, in this thing. And so, for example, uh, the controller, what we refer as a controller in this talk and in general, is just a single reconcile loop of a resource. So what we are doing is just uh, going through a resource and reconciling the, 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 expect, the expected state with the real state of the, of the resource. Then an, a manager or an operator is a set of controllers. So you can think of it as the Kube Controller Manager, for example. Uh, a custom resource is an instance of a custom resource definition. And then we have the owners in concept, uh, which is uh, a controller owns a resource, and is this controller the responsible for driving the observed state of a resource to the desired state of this resource. And then the act of watching is being being be interested in, in something happening in the cluster, so we need to act um, before be, because of that in order to drive our resource to the desired state of what we observed in the world. Okay, so finally it's time to start talking uh, uh, about design pattern. And for warming up, let's start to focus on our first family of design pattern. And, uh, and what we are do, uh, lo focusing on is how to orchestrate many controllers. It, it could seem counterintuitive starting from many controllers, but uh, in reality, we have this kind of pattern in, in Kubernetes since the beginning. So we start from 
this set of pattern because we hope that they are familiar to the audience and, and this will basically help to build up uh, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, more specifically, we are going to look at three partners today. A controller watch, two controllers watching the same object or many controllers watching a set of related objects. And the last one is uh, API contracts. Yeah, so let's start with, let's start talking about what's in, um, about uh, controllers what's in the same object. So the idea is pretty simple. We have one controller uh, that is responsible, that owns a custom resource and is responsible for driving this resource. In this case, for example, if you think about cluster API, we can say that the machine controller owns the machine custom resource. So just as a reminder, let's, let's, uh, I'm going to repeat that again. It, the idea is that uh, you have the, the external world that is this machine, real machine somewhere uh, at some cloud, for example. And what I'm, what I'm going to do here is to drive the, 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 what I observe on the world to the desired state of this resource. So this is what means zoning. And so say that we want to extend this, uh, this controller and we don't want to introduce more logic into it. So uh, one straightforward way would be that we have yet another controller. In this case, for example, we want to create uh, backups. So we have the volumes backup controller and it's going to do backups from time to time when we want it to do. Uh, but for example, we are going to, to delete a machine right now and we want to to make a backup right before this machine is really deleted. So what we can do, for example, instead of putting that logic into the machine controller, which would make it harder to maintain, harder to understand, we have just the volumes backup controller that is just doing the backup. And what it's going to do is something is going to add a finalizer to, other, to our resource, and this volumes backup controller, for example, is going to, to watch for this object, and when it finds a delete on time stamp on it, it's going to do all the triggering of the backup, and then when it's done, and it will remove the finalizer, and so Kubernetes will garbage collect the resource. So in the end, the machine custom, re the machine custom resource will get garbage collected when we have the final backup of the machine before even get it's, it's completely gone. So some lessons learned here. Uh, Use when you want to make progress after a precondition is met. In this case, for example, the delete on timestamp of the controller is non null, and I want to do something. Like I want to do a backup right now. Um, the pros is that the, repos the responsibility is very well defined. I'm not adding complexity to the controller that I have. I, I am adding this on another controller that is doing only this. Uh, it's a battle tested pattern. We know it very well in, in Kubernetes, and we see this, this on lots of controllers that are very widely used. And, and some cons, for example, is that yeah, you, you need to orchestrate somehow. So in this case, you could add uh, annotations or you could have something to, to, to sequence your operations if you are working with, with a single resource. And then uh, there is behavioral dependencies between controllers that are not very well documented. We'll go through that later on. Uh, but yeah, the, we, you, we need to document these kind of behavioral dependencies. And this is, this is a con of this, of this pattern. OK. Let's move to a slightly more complex uh, pattern. The, and also this is existing Kubernetes since the uh, early days, so we are using an example from Kubernetes. You all, know, you all know that there is a deployment controller that owns the deployment. And uh, when a deployment is reconciled, what happens is that it creates another resource, which is the replica set. So let's stop for a second on, on on what is happening is that there is a relation between two custom resources. In this, the simplest way to document this relation is saying that this is a parent-child relation. Okay. And second, there is also like an intimate knowledge between those pieces. So the deployment controller know exactly what a replica set is, how the spec is done, how the status uh, uh, updates. So those are the principle of this pattern. And the, the last bit is that there is, we have a second controller that basically owns and is responsible for, for, for the replica set. The first controller uh, closed the loop by w watching how the replica set is, is uh, progressing and basically rolling up the state at, at deployment level. So this is a pattern that 
we, I, I hope that we, we, we all known, but generalizing a little bit, when we can reuse this pattern. So when the, the, the main point is that we can reuse this pattern when there is a relation, a parent-child semantic relation between the, the object that, that you control. What are the pros is that this is battle tested, it exists in Kubernetes and it, it scales well. Uh, you can have different layering of complexity, uh, machine deployment, replica set and pod which are controlled by the Kubelet. Also, we, we all know, know very well that it, it could become pretty sophisticated. You can add uh, history uh, of change, rollbacks, uh, deployment strategy, so it is a pretty powerful pattern. What are the, co the cons is that we have two resources, uh, two custom resources, we have two controller, and uh, w whenever uh, the progressing of your process gets stuck, it's hard to debug. You, you don't know exactly to which controller logs to look, etc., etc. And the same is that given this intimate knowledge of the object, whenever you want to change something, basically you have impact on, on, two, uh, on two controllers. Okay, after introducing these two first pattern, which, which are our history, let, let, let's start talking a little bit uh, about something more complex or more fun. So we start talking about a uh, pattern that, that we call an uh, API contract. This, we are using an example for cluster API. So we have the, a machine controller that basically owns the machine. And we all know that a machine could be created on different type of infrastructure. In this example, is we are using the sphere infrastructure. But what if we want to create our machine on a different infrastructure? AWS, GKE, whatever. We don't want to rewrite a different machine controller. We, we want to use the same. And what is the key to make this possible? The key to, to make this possible is basically to identify a small set of fields that are common to all the machine infrastructure uh, implementation. For making this simple, but it is pretty realistic, we assume that all the machine at the end has to have a field that is called machine infrastructure ready, that basically feedback to the, to the machine controller the only information that it cares about, my machine is ready. Okay, this field basically is our API contract. And by using this API contract, what we can do? We can create a controller that owns the machine implementation. But given that the dependencies between this layer down and the layer up is a well-known field, basically the, the lower level is swappable. And this is pretty powerful. In Cluster API, we are using this uh, extensively. So, Lesson learned using this path. When we can use it, when there is this semantic relation between object, uh, between an object and a set of related objects, the key word in this case is set. And the example was machine and all the machine infrastructure implementation. Okay. Second, and for most important part is that we can use this pattern when there is a, it is possible to identify a set of common API fields between all the machine implementation. This makes the pattern generic. In the example, we discussed about status infrastructure already. The pro, it allows swappable implementation. It is powerful. In Cluster API, we have, I don't know, more than 30 implementation of machine infrastructure. So it works well. We use it extensively. What are the cons? Is that in order to agree, agree to, to this contract is something that requires discussion among all the stake, uh, of the stakeholder. So it requires a certain degree of communication and I thanks the Cluster API community to make this possible. Another downside. Once the contract is, is defined, most probably over time you have to evolve it. 
and these again require coordination, et cetera, et cetera. And the last bit of information is that given that you cannot basically, when you implement your machine controller, you don't know the, the concrete implementation of the machine infrastructure. When you implement your controller, you are required to use unstructured client or the, gener uh, or the generic client from client Go for assessing the fields. And this makes writing your code a little bit more uh, complex. Yeah, w one question, Fabrizio. So in that case, uh, what is cool is that uh, since the, this is the contract is so small, it's also easier to maintain, I guess, right? Yeah, if I can give a recommendation is that one tip to, to make this uh, pattern sustainable is that when you define your contract, so the common surface of API between all the implementation, you have to keep as small as possible. This make easier to manage and, uh, and evolve over, over time. Okay, so great. Uh, so far, so good. So we started from looking at how we can uh, observe one, one resource with different controllers. Then we saw how we can have um, strictly custom resources or even hierarchical custom resources uh, managed. And then we saw how we can have a very small field of se uh, a f set of fields that we can uh, put as a contract. Uh, now it's time to shift perspective. So instead of uh, working uh, on, on, on this space, we are going to see how we can extend a single controller. And so the first one is, is uh, the simpler one. So when it comes to extend the capabilities of a single controller, the first thing to notice is that this approach is not used extensively in Kubernetes. So we can see that, for example, you can plug your own scheduler, um, which is slightly different, but you can, you can do that. You also have uh, dynamic admission control, but this is not really a controller. So you, you could say that you already have some kind of extensibility, but for example, the scheduler example that I put is just replacing the scheduler. It's not like extending it. So despite the idea of extending a control is not yet used uh, in core Kubernetes extensively, uh, we see that on, on the ecosystem, this is getting traction more and more. And so we are going to talk about two main designs uh, that will allow, uh, will allow us to do this. Uh, so it's one of it is in process extensions, and the other is out of process extensions. So first, uh, the, the first one is in proxy extension. So the simplest way to extend a controller is to just introduce support for, pl for plugins. So you could, you could think of it as shelling out to a binary that you just call from the controller, or using some more sophisticated things, uh, like, for example, a Golan plugin or a Hasicore plugin, for example. For instance, one thing that you, you, should, you should have into account is how you are going to deploy this binary, how you are going to make this binary visible to your controller. So for example, uh, the Velero CLI, what it does when you perform the installation, you say which backend you want to use, and so it will create, a, it will download the binary for you uh, on a sidecar. And so you have other examples, like for example, core DNS. If you want to extend core DNS with your specific logic, you have to rebuild it. So it's like different approaches to the same problem. But for example, the core DNS one is a simpler uh, approach to, to the problem. Um, so let's, let's look into, into the uh, lessons learned about this one. So it's, it's, it's cool uh, when you can execute external binaries because this is the other problem. Uh, this is running in, our, uh, in, in the same namespace as our controller. Can we trust this binary, what it's going to do? Um, for, for the pros, this is similar to the CNI and the Velero model. We already know it works. We, we have uh, already people using that. And also, the, the, the error space is, is, nar is narrow in the sense that we don't have the network in the middle, for example. So we just have a binary, we call it, and we wait. And for, for cons, we need to do some kind of binary, uh, either download or registration ahead of time. So uh, that's, that's something that we have to do. So uh, it's also hard to prevent side effects, for example, produced by the binary. Uh, we need to understand what the binary is doing. Is it, uh, can you run it again? Um, it's, it's the kind of problems that we find with maybe binaries that we don't control completely. And of course, you need to have binary compatibility. Uh, this is usually is not a problem, maybe, uh, but you need the OS and the architecture of, of your machine to match uh, the controller where the controller is running. 
And so because of that, there is a variant of that one that is, we see also this coming more and more over time. I'm not going to put a lot of time into that, but this is just the variant of WebAssembly. Instead of having a binary, uh, a binary that needs to match our OS and our architecture, it's a WebAssembly binary, and our controller just creates a runtime uh, for WebAssembly and runs it. And a good, a good thing about this, it's basically the same. It's only, you can see that the, that the pros is, um, it, it's going to run everywhere. Uh, and it's also uh, more, like, it, it's more isolated than the previous one. Because this is going to run on our WebAssembly runtime. And so this is, this is more, more controlled. OK. So now, the alternative to in-process plugin of course, is out of process plugin. Let's see how this can work. So in the solution that we are presenting, what, what we are proposing is that your controller needs an additional component. We are calling it extension management. This extension management is uh, something that is responsible to watch for which plugin exists in your system. How we can define which plugin is in your system? An idea is that to use another, an additional CR, in the example we are calling Webhook Configuration Customer Source, that basically instruct or define where your plugin is. So it gives the URL, it gives the CI bundle to connect it, uh, or, and everything is necessary to, for your system to talk with the plugin. It, it, it acts as a disc discovery mechanism, basically. When the plugin is discovered, the next step is you also, inside your controller, you also have your controller core logic. So the plugin gets registered in your core lo uh, logic. So whenever a uh, Custom resource get reconciled, uh, and uh, whenever something has to be done, your core logic at this point is capable to call the plugin, which is responsible from some additional behavior or, 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 or um, that basically it, it extends your controller. So, taking a, a, a little bit step back on, on this pattern, few things are worth to notice. So the core idea of this pattern is to run plugin in a separate process. That's the main goal. Everything else, the discovery mechanism that we discussed, is plumbing, is something that helps us to reach the final goal, that is to run the, the plugin. It, can be, it could be implemented in a different flavor. Uh, we showed this implementation because it it uh, uh, reminds the how the dynamic extension web book works. So maybe that some of you are familiar to the web mutation web book configuration and stuff like that. So it is the same. Let me say approach. Second things worth to notice is that with respect to the previous pattern, there is a lot of moving parts. This is something that, that we have to keep in mind. So let, let's talk about uh, lesson learned. So when, when you have to use it, when, when it makes sense to basically to take charge of all the, these components. Point number one is that when your plugin basically requires different security context, I make you an example in Cluster API. Uh, our controller are, have a pretty powerful airbag uh, permission. Most specifically, they can access, for instance, the cloud identity of stuff. And we don't want that the plugin to be run with the same identity, because it could be dangerous. So running the, by running the plugin into a separate process, in, into a separate pod, we can assign the plugin a dedicated security context with very limited uh, um, airbag permission. The second pro or the second reason for using this pattern is this pattern basically allows you to add or remove plugins at a time, which is a pretty powerful 
feature to, to have. So another pro is that uh, your plugin runs a separate process. So if the, the, the plugin basically cannot screw up uh, the, 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 the core controller, the, the worst thing that it can do is that it does not give an answer. But your, your controller continues to run. Uh, another nice thing is that you have the option to deploy a plugin like you deploy any application on Kubernetes. At the end, it is a pod with a deployment, with a security account, and all, all this stuff. Let's talk about the cons a little bit. The controller has a dependencies, has now has a dependencies with an external service. And this is sometimes annoying because you have to take care of authorization, authentication, network policies, network fa uh, failure policies, back pressure, basically everything that gets into the picture when you call an external service, when you make a network call. The last point is that there are also some in organizational uh, implication in this pattern because you can have basically two different person which are responsible of what gets into, into, into the system. So if you have a person that is responsible to manage the webhook uh, um, configuration, this person is, is basically able to gate which plugin gets used. And this is a, a, a sort of security mechanism that can help uh, uh, in organizations. Yeah, I, I, I won't talk too much about this one, but it's the, it's the same as the previous one, only that the service, instead of being outside of the network, is inside of our, of our same pod. So it serves the, the network uh, the network namespace of the kernel. So you can just reach your, your service through the local host. And so that's, that's the variant of this one. So yeah, this one has also implications uh, because it's again going to be in the same namespace, but also you don't have to go to the network, which is uh, you have to measure. Okay, we are nearly uh, at the end uh, of this presentation about extensible design pattern. And there is one, and for maybe the most important question that we still have to answer. What is next in this journey? What is next in, in extensible controller? So before trying to answer to the question, I think that there are two points that, that we, should, we should recognize. First is that everyone, everyone in this room have a common goal to use Kubernetes to solve complex, which are more and more complex, more challenging use cases. The second thing that we have to recognize is that this is a, a hard problem, is something that we cannot solve alone. It's something that we have to solve uh, to solve as a community. Yeah. So with this in mind, there is there is a set of problems to yet solve. There is a lot. This list is very long. Uh, but for example, the first question is how to document behavioral dependencies. So we we know how to document APIs. We have API documentation. But how we document behavioral dependencies? Like this control is going to be that, and then this one is going to pause until this happens. This kind of thing. Textual, it's not so good, right? So how we do do that? Um, how to make it easier to debug when a resource is not is not progressing? Why this resource is still on pending? What is going on. We have, we, have, we have ways to do that, and SIG instrumentation is, going, is, is working on that, is providing us uh, really good tools to do that, but still this is an open question. And also how to define contracts for extensibility points, how we are going to do that, how we are going to also document that. So we, we have a lot of questions. So the next point is how, as a community, we can react to this. So do we need some framework? In Cluster API, we are starting, we are developing, we have a proposal, and we are managing some code with, with something related that we call runtime SDK, which is, at the end, it, it is a, a small framework that is designed to help you to manage out of process ex extension. Can we generalize this as a community? Can we make it, re it reusable across projects so everyone don't have to reinvent the wheel? Same applies to decisions like binary versus WebAssembly. Web, web if, as a community, we can agree on which one of the two we prefer, 
basically we can start working together to a set of library that will make the life of the next person implementing a controller much easier. And finally, we can have also the same approach to, to problem like how do we package our plugin? How do we distribute it, them? Do we, do we have to reinvent something or we can re rely on standard like o o OCI or something else that exists today? So in conclusion, extensible controller is a very interesting topic. Uh, and despite the work that, that we did in some project, we, st we <laughs> agree that there is still much to, to explore in this space. And, and the only way that we know is by try and, and even sometimes failing. So it is a challenge, but also an opportunity. So le let's work together to improve the art of developing extensible controllers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. A great session. We have now five minutes for Q&A. If anyone has any questions, um, we're going to repeat them for the virtual audience. So any hands for questions? No. It was such a good, great session, so no one has any questions. Uh, but you can obviously probably speak with the speakers after the session and within KubeCon as well. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you.